Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Healthy Living with Mild Cognitive Impairment. I am Bonnie Nutkinson, an Outreach Specialist here at the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. And uh, just going to go over a few housekeeping things before we go jump into uh, the program. Please feel free to keep your uh, video on and talk um, as we ask for people to participate. Um, if it does happen where maybe you forget to mute yourself, if you need to take a phone call or maybe cough a little bit, I'll go ahead and, and just mute you. Um, but please feel free. We want this to be a welcoming um, environment so you can feel free to talk and share your experience. Uh, so today, um, like I mentioned, we'll have Dr. Megan Sulzdorf here with us and uh, Dr. Nate Chin and then uh, my good friend Sherry Lowe. Uh, who will be helping us with a mindfulness meditation practice, and we'll have some Q&A. Today's program is being recorded. Uh, the program usually takes about a month to get posted on the website from the time it's um, recorded. It has to be edited. We make sure we don't have anybody's faces. We don't have your names and that kind of stuff on the recording, um, and then we put it up on our website. So if there's something you wanted to hear, you can make sure that uh, you can go back and rewatch that after the program. Um, I will send out an email to all attendees that have the slides from today, um, as well as the survey link to evaluate the program, along with any other information we might talk about that would be helpful for you to have. Um, uh, Dr. Chin, do you have anything you'd like to say before we get started? Thanks, Bonnie. I just want to welcome everyone to this very exciting uh, presentation by Dr. Zilsdorf. Uh, Bonnie and I and a lot of the staff who are on the call have the, the good privilege of being able to work with Megan. Uh, she is an expert when it comes to both stress and resilience. And so it's not just about the negative things of stress. It's what we can do. Uh, and one of the things I want to say just from a personal uh, standpoint is it's so easy for us to write off stress and say, oh, I'm fine, things are okay. But chronic stress, as Dr. Zilsdorf is going to talk about, is not healthy for us. And she'll go over some of the reasons why. But how we address stress is as important as how we address our overall health, our cardiovascular health, our brain health. And it is something we have to work on on a daily basis. And so I, I'm really glad for those that are attending today. And I see there's a lot of people. So I think a lot of people believe what I believe too, and that this is a really important topic. So uh, thank you all for attending. And thank you, Dr. Zulsdorf, uh, for giving us your time so that we can learn more. Yeah, thank you, uh, Bonnie and Nate. I am so happy to be here today. Uh, good morning to everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I It's great to, now I've got my slides up, so I can't actually see all the people in the room, but it was um, amazing seeing everyone come in. I wish we could be sharing a space together, but I'm glad that uh, we can at least connect um, over the, the internet this morning and spend a couple hours together. Um, Bonnie, I just want to make sure, I'm sorry if I, I'm having trouble reversing my slides, but I want to make sure I can at least move them forward. There we go. Okay. So my arrows aren't working. So apologies, anybody, if you want me to go back, I'll have to figure out how to do that. Um, so I'll just start out by telling you a little bit about who I am. Um, I think of myself as a public health researcher. I trained as an epidemiologist. Uh, I've worked with our Wisconsin Registry for Alzheimer's Prevention and our Alzheimer's Disease Research Center here on campus for a long time. And now I actually uh, work with some really incredible colleagues uh, in the UW-Madison School of Nursing. So I'm not a clinician, but I surround myself uh, with wonderful people who are and who really help me kind of think about um, uh, how what I studied, you know, at, at the public health level actually is meaningful for, um, for patients, for patient families, 
for people out in the world and for translating research to actual interventions that people can make use of. Uh, and I welcome, I know that probably a lot of you uh, might have familiarity with some of the areas that I work in today. And uh, of course, I would welcome uh, your perspectives on the, all of the things that we're gonna talk about today as we move through the conversation as well. And I know that everybody in the audience uh, would benefit from from hearing from each other. So I one of my main areas of research, uh, why Bonnie and Nate invited me here today is because um, as Dr. Tin mentioned, and I'm sorry here, my slides are on one place and my camera's in another. So I'll be kind of looking all over the place. But my main area of research, and actually I would say what I'm passionate about in life in general, is studying how our environments expose us to uh, both stressful experiences, but also resilience building conditions that might influence our memory health uh, as we age. I've been studying stress and cognition. I realized when I was putting this presentation together today for almost 15 years now, which is a really long time. <laughs> it was kind of shocking to me. Um, and so that said, I, I um, you know, it's a, it's a passion of mine. And like I was saying earlier, I know that for some of you, you may have hobbies that intersect with some of the things we're gonna talk about. You may have done these things professionally or might be currently doing them. Uh, I, I would love, I'm gonna give kind of like a brief summary today, but I am totally happy if someone wants to bring up some of the nuances, uh, we can kind of get into the weeds. And I know that, um, uh, that other folks on the call will be able to, to help me do that uh, when it's an area that kind of stretches my own expertise. But the thing I want to do is sort of first is just set up where we're going to go today so that everybody has a sense of the different things that we're going to talk about and any questions that they might have and maybe something to look forward to further down in the talk for the, the really boring stretches that I'll probably accidentally have in here. Um, the first thing I'm gonna do is talk about what we really mean when we say stress, right? Cause we say, this is a word that we say a lot and we say it in different contexts. And one of my jobs as a researcher is to always kind of be defining it at least so that, and no one has to define it in the same way that I do, but it helps us all kind of get off on the same page. Um, if I'm telling you what I mean when I'm talking about stress. So I always like to start off by saying, I think of stress as a, a large all encompassing process that is composed of a lot of different pieces. And it's really interesting. And I think it, one thing that I didn't know until this became an area of research for, for me is, how those pieces actually are tied together. So unfortunately, let me see if I can make this so that I can see people a little bit better. Eh, that's not gonna work, but I'll I, I give me some nods or, or something and that'll be helpful. I wanna start off asking you, the folks in the room here, has anyone had an experience and you can wave your arms around or you can put the little yellow hand up. Has anyone had an experience where they were facing a challenge and it was not altogether pleasant, but at the same time facing that challenge, especially coming right up on it, they felt really clear headed suddenly and really confident about their ability to meet the challenge. Is that an experience that rings a bell? We have uh, Sharon, if you want to go, and then Nate. Oh, Sharon, you're on. There you go. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, I would, I would, <clears throat> I would say the, the the experience that came first came to mind was getting the diagnosis of myocognitive impairment. You know. Um, it was pretty stressful. And at the same time, I'm finding um, that the more I learn and stuff, and it, it's 
almost, I can't say exhilarating, energizing maybe is a good word. Yeah. Yes. I, that, I, I know the feeling that you're talking about. Has anyone else had, had this experience? Does it sound familiar? So what about, and no one needs to share here, but has anyone had the experience where they make it through that deadline or they make it through that major ordeal that they're going through and they do a great job and they're, they're proud of what they did. They were feeling good while they did it. And then a day or two later, you come down with an awful cold. You, you start feeling that tickle in your throat and your throat gets sore and you know that you're going to spend the next couple of days in bed and you're just relieved that it waited until you got through what you needed to get through. Is that an experience that anyone has had? We've got some head nodding going on here. Yeah. This is an experience that I've had a lot, uh, especially with big professional challenges, but sometimes with big personal challenges too. Um, it, you know, you, you make it through and then you just crash afterward. And then again, no one needs to, to share here unless they want to, but I'm wondering if anyone has seen someone that they're close to, or maybe just someone that they know in passing, go through a tough time. And when you meet up with them and they've come through it and they're on the other side, you're happy for them, but you feel like you can almost see that, that adverse experience that they've had written on their face. Maybe they look a little bit older. Maybe they look a little bit more tired. They look like they're recovering, but you can you can almost see it in the lines there. So this is this is real. And what I want to talk about today is how these phenomena that we notice in ourselves and in other people and feel very disparate. They feel not necessarily connected to each other, but in fact, all of these experiences are part of the same social to physiological process, and they all rely on this idea of stress. We'll also talk about ways in which that process contributes to brain and cognitive health and why it's important to think about stress as a risk factor, but also as a modifiable risk factor. So we can't always change the stressors that are in our lives. And I'll talk about what stressors are in just a minute, but sometimes we can change the impact that the challenges in our life have on our own health. And, and we'll, we'll focus in on some of the ways we can do that. In other words, what can we do about it? How can we interrupt this process by which stress in the outside world actually gets under our skin and even into our brain? And how do we disrupt that process before it harms us? And then finally, uh, I am really excited to turn over my spot here to Ms. Sherry Lowe, who is an expert in mindfulness meditation, and we're going to transition from talking about coping with stress to actually learning about one way to do it that has a lot of scientific evidence behind it. Uh, Ms. Lowe is going to go over the ins and outs of mindfulness meditation with you and even engage in a practice, I believe. So um, really fun activity to kind of end out uh, a topic that can be kind of a downer sometimes, right? Okay, so first then let's just kind of continue defining stress. So, and some different kind of categories of stress that I think are really useful to, to think about and to uh, talk about when we're talking about stress's impact on health. And I, this picture of me was supposed to pop up in the next, uh, the next click. So you'll just have to look at it for an extra minute here. Um, so very broadly, stress can be defined 
as the mental and the physical, this is what I call the social to biological processes that are activated when we perceive and we respond to experiences that are threatening or challenging. These experiences are what we call stressors. So stressors are the events uh, or conditions that cause stress. And first and foremost, stress isn't necessarily all negative, right? We, we got into this just a little bit earlier with someone talking about uh, the sense of, of um, Energies, energy that can come from rising to meet a challenge and knowing that you are doing so to your best capabilities. You'll hear stress researchers and psychologists talk about something called eustress. So it's got that EU on the front of it. That means that it's the good or the, the kind of often beneficial stress that can result from a demanding but desirable task that we are engaged in. So this is a picture of me giving a talk, kind of like this one, although I got to say, as many of you know, it feels a little more relaxed here. When you, It's when you put that microphone up to your mouth, right, that you really feel your heart start pounding, something about it. But for me, giving a talk like this to a big group of people, because this is a this is a challenge for me. This is something that makes me nervous. I'm kind of a quiet person. I, you know, I'm not great at, at speaking in crowds or anything. Um, but this is an example for me of a you stress situation. For other people, it could be a, a big athletic event. It could be a job interview. It could be some other activity that you are really um, kind of proud of and you want to do well in, but you're proud to be there. It was an accomplishment just to be there and now you want to excel. That's you stress. Distress is the kind of stress that we usually imagine when we talk about the topic. Distress is the bad stress that results from undesirable events, financial hardship that we're going through, interpersonal relationship conflicts that we are struggling with, losing a loved one. This is the kind of stress that we're often talking about when we're talking about stress and health, right? Distress, that negative kind of stress that's resulting from things that you do not want to be part of. So another component of stress that it's really important to kind of focus in on when we talk about stress and well-being or we talk about stress and health is the duration of the stress in question of the, I'm an epidemiologist, so I'll use this word exposure all the time. But what I just mean is how long you're experiencing uh, a given condition and, and here in particular stress, maybe how frequently something is happening to you. That's of really huge importance when we talk about the impacts of stress on health, and I'm gonna get into exactly why. We actually, uh, we talk about acute stressors pretty regularly, right? Um, when it's a matter of you stress, we will often talking about being excited but nervous. That sums up exactly how I'm feeling today and how I was feeling this morning when I was clicking into uh, Bonnie's Zoom link that she had sent me. When it's a matter of distress, you've probably heard the acute stress response referred to as fight or flight. Is this something that everybody has a pretty strong sense of? Has everybody had experiences where sometimes they chose to fight and sometimes they, they decided on the flight route? Yeah. So this fight or flight is literally our, as a human species, but other animal species have the same thing. This is our acute stress response is just in, in three little words. Any given species, acute stress response, as you can probably imagine, because we're talking about fight or flight now, is actually really important to its evolutionary survival, right? So the human acute stress response is incredibly adaptive 
in some situations. We could not have survived as a species without it. The thing is, evolutionarily speaking, most stress should be acute. Once we successfully fight or flee this grizzly, the situation should be resolved one way or the other, right? Life should return to normal. And that huge stressor, which was existential, it was, re it was really important to deal with it, but now it should be gone. It should be completely absent. It's not lingering. Maybe it's lingering in our mind, but it's not lingering outside the door, right? That bear is gone. In today's world, the issue is that for many, many people, acute stressors are not the typical stress experiences, right? We're a lot more concerned these days, oftentimes with chronic stress. That's a stressful situation that is impacting daily life for an extended period of time. And, and almost as importantly as the duration is that the issue with it is that there's not a set end point or cutoff that we can see. We don't feel in control of the situation. We can't see an end point to it necessarily. Does this resonate? And no one has to share anything, but do, do these kind of different sort of stressors uh, resonate with people and make sense in terms of what you've experienced, what you've seen other people experience? They feel really different. Right, and we're gonna talk a lot about why that is. Another thing that I wanna emphasize is that although everyone experiences both acute and chronic stressors at some point, we know that there are some individual characteristics and some individual situations like having lower income, uh, like having a, developing a chronic illness, like developing physical limitations, these will tend to, the, and research shows this, they are related to greater exposure to chronic stress. And this is again, because these are conditions that create adversity for us in an environment that is not necessarily um, facilitating or enabling us to cope with these adverse situations and keep on keeping on, right? It's di more difficult to thrive the more sources of adversity you have. And then you kind of see this cycle. So when you feel like everything starts going wrong and then it almost ripples out and creates more problems, that is absolutely a real phenomenon. And that is part of the problem with chronic stress and how it gets under our skin is that stress begets stress more often than not. So now we will uh, we'll talk about stress as a bodily response. You will not be tested on this particular slide at all. And I'll actually, you don't even have to pay attention to all these boxes and body parts. I'll, I'll kind of talk through it. But I wanna talk about this to kind of give you a sense of why the acute stress response both helps us survive a bear attack, but also why the same process leads to our mouth feeling dry, like mine is right now, when we're giving a talk to a group of people that we really want to impress and do well at. So there are two pathways that become active when I perceive a threat in the world and a potential need to respond to it. Whether it's a big bear, because I'm camping, in northern Wisconsin, and uh, you know, the you know the black bears are mostly harmless, but they're still a little alarming when they show up. Or when I'm facing a big deadline, or or um, maybe a, a challenge at my kid's school. The first thing that happens is that my brain sends a message to one part of my adrenal gland, which is located just adjacent to my kidneys, so way down. Right, we've already gotten outside of the brain. The adrenal gland immediately floods the bloodstream with two hormones. One of them is called norepinephrine. Does anyone have a sense of what the second is called coming from the adrenal gland? 
adrenaline. It's it's adrenaline, right? And most of us probably have a sense of what that feels like when adrenaline floods into our system for whatever reason, whether it's big or small, we have kind of, we can, we know that word and what the, the feeling that it's associated with. So what adrenaline or epinephrine is another name for it and norepinephrine do is they primarily act on the cardiovascular system and they enact some really important changes really quickly. They speed up your heart rate, right? They also widen all of the bronchial tubes in your lungs. So suddenly, you know, you're, you're breathing a little freer probably, and they dilate some blood vessels. In particular, they dilate the blood vessels that are in the major skeletal muscles. They also kind of turn down a couple other activities in your body a notch. They, for instance, constrict blood vessels in your skin and in all the, your other smaller systems. They also are, they also divert water away and this is your liver acting, but it's, it's acting via uh, this adrenaline and norepinephrine. They direct water away from non-essential things like making saliva because suddenly maybe you should conserve water a bit, right? And you feel that in your mouth because your mouth gets really dry and suddenly gets a lot harder to spit those words out. So what you are ready to do now with your big dilated uh, bronchial tubes, you know, they're widened, you're breathing free, your heart is pumping, your, all of the blood vessels in your skin are really restricted. You are ready to run and leap and claw and you're not gonna bleed much if you get injured, right? Just a tiny bit more slowly, there's another pathway that kicks in. And it's what they call the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access or the HPA axis. And occasionally the, the word HPA axis will kind of make it into the, the media as a buzzword. It's called that because a part of the brain called the hypothalamus talks to another part of the brain, the pituitary gland that everybody, pituitary gland's got a lot of jobs, right? So everybody's heard of that. That releases a hormone that tells actually going back down to the, our kidney area, a different part of our adrenal gland, the adrenal cortex, to start releasing extra cortisol. This is where the word cortisol comes from, right? It's being released from the adrenal cortex. And cortisol is, is maybe something that some of you have heard of. Uh, it, it definitely is a word that I have to use a lot in my research. Probably the place that we see it most often out in the world is with, um, it's a steroid. And so we see steroid creams, right? Uh, we see them in anti-itch creams, for instance. And that's actually all part of the same process again. So cortisol has really important impacts on the immune and the metabolic systems. First and foremost, to maximize available energy, cortisol temporarily suppresses normal immune function, whether that's the kind that's making your skin uh, itchy because you you're have it, inflammation happening, um, but also the kind that you know is slower and tends to keep you healthy and kills viruses and bacteria uh, in your system before they can make you sick. Cortisol also works via the liver to do something really important, and that is to convert a lot of stored energy called glycogen to a more readily available source of energy, which is glucose in your bloodstream, blood sugar. So cortisol is helping your liver to flood your bloodstream with energy that you are gonna to need to use to run really, really fast and then to recover too. Along with these kind of systemic changes, 
Acute stress is also doing, actually, it's, it's acting in our brain. So these are kind of in our peripheral bodies, right? The rest of our body, neck down. But it's also acting in our brain simultaneously. And it's doing things that if you think about it, you can almost feel. So it's increasing blood flow in key parts of the brain. Your visual cortex, so helping with visual processing, making it fast, making it clear. But also the prefrontal cortex, and so in the short term, these really lightning fast changes, because these are these all have to happen very immediately, right, to respond, they can be really helpful. Our thinking is clear. We feel energy. We feel high motivation, thanks to that prefrontal cortex. This is where that sense of not exhilaration, but energy comes from. We feel ready to go and we feel highly motivated to act. The body is at its strongest and its fastest. But what do you think about all of these changes that we've talked about? Do they sound like something you want to keep going for a long time? With the, the, the faster heart rate, the blood glucose just elevating to really high levels, your immune function being suppressed. These are really good for an hour, right? It sounds exhausting long-term. It is, ex it's not only, ex yes. So stress is exhausting. And part of that is that these processes are exhausting to your system. You just, you just went out of like a nice stable resting place where all of your body is functioning normally. And you just kicked it into the highest drive possible because faced with an existential threat, you're gonna, you're maximizing your chances of surviving, right? So the changes though, as Bonnie's mentioned, they're not, they're not meant to be sustained. They should, they're not sustainable, but also they're not meant to be sustained. They're a deviation from the normal that we want, which is actually kind of kicking back and like sitting around and eating with our friends and start, you know, um, doing our daily activities. If they're not resolved, you know, a lot of the things we talk about, and we'll, we'll get into that in just on the next slide here, they begin to cause problems for the human body's otherwise perfectly balanced systems. This, this form of, of homeostasis that our body really likes to be in. Let's see if I can move forward. Okay. So, that is kind of what we're coming to, right? Is the longer term effects of the bodily stress response. These are things that we start to worry about if the stressor is not resolved, if the bear stays at the door, or if it's a chronic stressor that we're talking about, like say financial hardship, we're thinking about it all the time. We're dealing with repercussions every day. It's there, it never, it never goes away from the door, right? Chronic stress activation eventually results in dysfunction throughout the body systems, because as Bonnie said, the body gets exhausted from this. And the results can actually be seen in several different downstream health and disease markers that you're probably, you probably kind of see these coming, right? From what we talked about with the metabolic and the cardiovascular and the immune systems. Because of a lot of this dysfunction is actually also to some degree a normal function of an aging body. Our systems don't quite work as well. They tend to get a little bit dysregulated and they tend, when they get dysregulated, they tend to take a little bit longer to come back to, nor uh, to normal. All of that is a pretty typical part of the aging process. But because this dysfunction happens independent of kind of our, our biological aging process, the premature presence of these markers of dysfunction due to stress is actually sometimes considered a sign of physical, we call it weathering under adverse conditions, like a fence will weather under stormy conditions and wind and rain, right? It's an actual stress-related acceleration of the normal aging process. At its core, that's what's happening. So the pieces of that, 
that you probably, like I said, kind of saw coming are that chronic stress we know is, a, is related to increased inflammation. And that actually seems a little bit counterintuitive because we just talked about how stress at first will actually suppress immune function. But what happens is that inflammation is a really key part of the immune response. And while those inflammatory responses are at first in the short term suppressed by cortisol, your body wants to get back to normal. So when they're suppressed over and over and over and repeatedly and over time, your body will actually upregulate inflammatory processes because it's like, we got to get this stuff going again. I guess I need to make more. So inflammation actually becomes elevated in the body in a context of chronic stress, even though it's suppressed at first. And that's actually kind of a common theme is your body sees a shortage of something or something's not working. So you start producing more and more and it becomes this kind of feedback loop. So metabolic disorders like insulin resistance are actually another long-term effect that works in a similar way. The glucose that we talked about that is pouring into your system, you don't actually need it when your worry is not something that you've got to run away from, your worry is something that you can't run away from, that you've got to sit at the kitchen table all night and work out. And there, your, the blood glucose that you've made available for yourself, it, it exceeds the cellular demands that your body needs because you don't need it to run really fast. And so it just sits there. And again, these delicate feedback loops become disrupted by all of that excess. And that's when insulin resistance starts to occur. And we start to see things like type two diabetes being a risk. And finally, cardiovascular disease. I, if, if any of you have been around as long as I have, you might remember that way back in the eighties, um, there was quite a lot of news media around stress, mo mostly work stress at the time is what the big conversations were about and cardiovascular disease. Um, these, these high power jobs leading to hypertension, leading to heart attacks and so on. This was definitely in the news. And that what we were figuring out is that the combination of increased heart rate because your heart's pumping and those constricted vessels, that results in hypertension or high blood pressure, right? And then the inflammation that we talked about earlier can actually make it worse because it can damage the vessel walls and that can lead to things like coronary artery disease and other problems like that. So these are systems, major health disorders that we think about uh, with aging and that we are, we work very hard to manage, um, you know, and that can create a lot of strain uh, for us. And we also talk about them as dementia risk factors, which I'm about to discuss. And stress is a major source of risk for these health conditions. Okay, so let's bring it to um, stress and, and cognitive health. And then I promise we'll switch over into happier uh, topics here and, and really talk about um, how we change stress impacts on health. So we just saw on that last slide, um, some of the really well studied relationships between stress and aspects of our physical health, right? But what about stress and memory health? Given how closely connected we know the body and the brain really are. That is a much newer field of research, but there's actually some pretty strong evidence that managing stress is good for our minds, both our brains and our cognitive abilities and symptoms. So Going back to kind of those definitions that we talked about, stress can be measured in a lot of different ways. We can talk about early life stressors. Uh, you might know these as adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. This is a big area that uh, uh, child uh, health and, and family health people talk about. We can also talk about recent stressful events because no matter what age we are, uh, stressful events can impact us. 
And we can, we can finally, we can talk about self-reported feelings of stress, sometimes called perceived stress. This is sort of the stress that you're feeling after an environmental stressor is at least kind of under your skin and you're thinking about it, you're processing it as, as a potential threat to you. All of these different measures of stress, no matter how we're measuring it, I could find you a study that found that stress associates with poor cognitive performance, just on a given cognitive test, like some of you may have taken at a clinician's office or something like that, poor, poor performance on that test, sometimes due to just cognitive load, like we can't focus in on a test when we've got this other big thing that we're thinking about. But also with Alzheimer's and related dementia changes in the brain, neurodegeneration, changes in volume in our brain, reductions in volume, changes in connectivity, some evidence that it actually associates with the plaques and tangles that we're often studying related to Alzheimer's disease. And overall, stress exposure, stress experiences have also been shown to associate with the risk for developing dementia later in life. So we've got this strong evidence that stress somehow leads to cognitive health and impairment, right? Um, and there are actually, based on what we know about stress and other health outcomes, there are a lot of different pathways that we can identify that might be plausible there, might explain those relationships. So first, both corticosteroids, cortisol, that steroid that we talked about, and inflammation have neurotoxic effects. They are toxic to the neurons in the brain. Specifically, they can damage brain cells in areas key to executive function, to our ability to kind of think and plan, and memory. They're impacting the prefrontal cortex that we talked about earlier because they're targeting it to do good stuff. And at the same time, they're doing, a, they have some unintended side effects there but also the hippocampus that we know is really important in memory. There's a lot of receptors there for corticosteroids. So the hippocampus tends to be impacted when uh, this chronic activation is happening. Second, just like we talked about, we know that vascular health is linked to brain health and that cardiovascular disease and diabetes arising from these chronically activated stress processes these are individual uh, independent risk factors for poor brain and memory health as we age, right? And finally, stress is acting on cognitive health and impairment directly, potentially, without any changes in actual brain structures even being necessary. And that's because, and I, I think that this will make intuitive sense to everybody here, stress is related to feelings of depression, feelings of anxiety, poor sleep, uh, poor ability to maintain all of the healthy behaviors that we know that we should be doing. And all of these conditions can also impact our cognitive capacity and our ability to function as best that we can. So Stress is impacting cognition via lots of pathways, right? Some are short-term, like the, like the neurotoxicity, some are longer term, but this diagram, <laughs> it's not meant to be a picture of doom and gloom, um, despite what it looks like. Instead, for me, when I see this diagram, what I think about is that it's a good illustration, all of these arrows, and these little uh, sad little pictures that I've inserted to represent different ideas. But what these mean to me is this is an illustration of all of the different opportunities and intervention points that exist for changing the relationship between stressors in our environment, injuries, career pressures, environmental stressors, and way downstream, our memory health we can intercept, we can disrupt these pathways at lots of different points. That when you see a complex path, sort of series of events like this, that's what it means to me. And we're gonna talk about uh, just a couple of different stress management 
tools today before I turn it over to Ms. Sherry. And she's gonna go into much more depth about the most promising tools or one of them. Because many of the stressors that adults encounter as we age, like financial stress, like chronic illness, like healthcare burden, because these things are stressful because of, because of things that are bigger than us, big structures, policies, our insurance, our healthcare, our changing bodies, they're, they're things that need to be fixed often by changes in policies or changes in laws or changes in, in environments, dementia-friendly environments and so on, not by individuals. So that is why, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not going to talk about reducing stressors, sometimes reducing the stressors that we are facing, the, the stressful experiences that we're having. It's just not under our control. But what could be under our control where we can focus and do our best is on a variety of coping tools that feasibly reduce those stressful experiences impact on our bodies. They disrupt the stress in the environment before it gets under our skin and into our brains. So there's my green circle focusing on, on stress rather than on stressors. Sorry, I didn't put that up earlier. So one of the things that I'll talk about first, because it's my personal favorite, this is a big area of research for me, is social activity and social engagements and social connectedness as a way to manage health effects of stress. Social engagement takes on, and this is why I love to study it and I'll never stop, it takes on so many different forms as people age and as their lives change, right? Sometimes our networks get bigger for some reason. Other times, for many people, our networks get smaller, but they get closer, they get tighter, they get more rewarding. And there's research that suggests that it's not necessarily the form of engagement socially that matters so much for health as it is the connections that we feel from whatever our social relationships look like. The research is often focused on self-reported social support, whether it's emotional support or whether it's more tangible supports, help that people get with their daily activities. But what we see over and over in the research, including out of our cohorts here in Wisconsin, is that perceived social support what people report to us on surveys, it predicts better cognitive function in both middle age and in older age, and actually a reduced risk of developing dementia over time. There are lots of longstanding theories in psychology to explain this, stress and coping theory in particular, um, suggests that connectedness predicts better health because it's a resource that we consider the minute we look out and we perceive a potential threat, we process that threat through a consideration of the people that we have around us and the resource and the strength that we represent together. So if you've got a network that you love and that you trust to stand by you, the impacts of stress, that relationship between the big stressor out here that you're seeing and what it does to your body in terms of your brain sending out messages like rally the troops, it's not quite as strong if you perceive that, hey, I'm gonna be all right because look at what I've got around me. Okay, so, um, whoops. Just because social support is literally uh, my favorite thing to talk about that isn't stress. And in fact, I like to talk about it a lot more than stress for obvious reasons. Uh, I'm gonna dive in just a little bit and show you one of my favorite studies that has come out recently because I think it's so interesting and it's so important from a public health perspective. So social connections and their role in health is a, it's a big complicated issue. Social connections are operating on health in a lot of different ways. We can imagine that they make it easier to be healthier uh, behaviorally. Um, they're actually a form of mental exercise for us. They exercise our brain when we're, work, when we're talking with other people and listening to other people. 
But I want to talk about something in particular, which is the interaction between social connection and a major chronic disease that we've been talking about, diabetes. So we know that exposure to stress can increase our risk for developing diabetes, right? And that's a major dementia risk factor. But we haven't talked too much about yet how it also is stressful to have diabetes and other chronic conditions. As anyone who has struggled to manage their diabetes knows, and this is definitely something that I've seen in my own family, the body can sometimes have a really hard time keeping itself regulated. And just like going a night without sleep, that's actually just like a physical stressor on our body, whether our brain is perceiving it as a stressor or not. Our body doesn't like that. It doesn't like blood sugar going up and down and up and down and up and down, just like it doesn't like not getting a good night's sleep. But it also can be psychologically stressful. Management is complicated. It is expensive. This is true whether you are a person who has diabetes yourself or whether you are working to help someone that you care about and care for in some cases manage their diabetes. And social connectedness, there's evidence that it may take some of that physical and emotional load off of people with diabetes. So this chart is from a nice big study actually in the Netherlands, not in the US. And it's a large study of people with and without diabetes and is representing their risk of developing dementia over time with those bars on the graph. So the higher the bar on this chart, the higher the dementia risk. And circled in green here are the people with diabetes. On the left, we have people who are diabetic and socially active. They report that they have a lot of social activities, a lot of relationships that they are happy about. On the right are people who are diabetic, but they report being not so socially active for whatever reason. And what you see is that overall, diabetes is a risk factor for dementia, certainly. The, the bars for people with dementia or with diabetes are just higher. But among diabetic people who report a lot of social activity, the risk is lower, the bar is lower. In fact, it's almost as low for the people on the left side of the graph who aren't circled at all, who don't have diabetes, they're diabetes free. So what these results suggest to me is that even if you have one major risk factor for dementia that you're worried about, like diabetes, social ties can help lower that risk by quite a bit. And that's really important news. Okay. I was just thinking about physical activity today because I saw people coming into town for the Iron Man here. Um, you've probably all heard a lot about physical activity. Uh, it's one of the most promising protective factors for brain health, right? Um, does anyone here like to engage in physical activity as a protective, th because they're thinking about brain health and we've heard a lot in these, um, these healthy living seminars? What kinds of activities do you do? Do you do the Ironman or are you out there doing more moderate forms of activity? Anyone can share, you can, I hope you can just turn on your microphone. Yeah, we have quite a few people, a uh, few of us do some physical activities. Sure, um, um, you have uh, some, someone here has a PT regimen that they do every day. Yes, I do that every day. And then I, like I said, I take a daily walk. And if the weather is um, bad that I can't walk, I have an indoor bike. So I'm always doing something every day that's physical. Same, yep, same. Is there yeah. anybody, does anyone want to admit being like me and they don't probably do as much physical activity as they should? They know they should, but maybe they can't for some reason, or they just, it's not their, <laughs> it's not their preferred mode. Okay. Well, one of my favorite things about the physical activity literature about, you know, regarding dementia that's emerging is that what we're beginning to understand is that mod you don't have to do the Ironman. You don't even have to be out there, you know, getting your heart rate really high. 
moderate and even light exercise is associated with reduced brain aging and slowed memory decline, even if you're out there doing a little bit. So if physical activity at any level is something that you enjoy, I got to say for me, I do not, I, I am not a, um, not a person that loves it, but I do walk to work every day. And that is, it's an important part of my day for me. And it makes me feel a little better. Like I'm actually doing something. And the, the thing is, is that actually one of the hypotheses about why low levels of physical activity even seem to be pretty helpful is because there may be indirect benefits for brain health and memory function and just well being generally via stress management. So, even those relatively low levels of activity, like taking a, a walk every day, it's associated with reductions in self reported stress. It's associated with reduced feelings of anxiety. It's associated with feelings of depression. And in fact, even low levels of activity have been shown to be associated with reduced pathway markers downstream consequences of the stress we've been talking about, like lower inflammation. So physical activity, really great research being done even here in Wisconsin and emerging that, that shows the promise of any level of physical activity, if that's something that, uh, that you like. And there are also, in the, yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say in the chat, um, we have some folks said they do soccer, strong bodies, uh, they do a boot camp, walking, biking, um, treadmill every morning and evening while watching the news or Jeopardy. Um, and That's then, me. That's where I'm at. <laughs> I mean, my dogs make me move. Like if yeah. I didn't have my dogs, I just want to sit on my couch. Um, I, I love, I love hearing about all these different and to, you know, physical activity can look a million different ways and everything that's, I wish I could see the chat. Cause yeah, it sounds like we have a whole variety showing up that people engage in. And then we have a question that goes back to the social connectedness. Yeah. Um, uh, and this is about the differences between extroverts and introverts. Mm -hmm. And the um, uh, question is, could it be that the quality of the connection is just as important as the quantity? Yep. Maybe even more so for introverts who, who might really value that quality over quantity? Yes. That is, that is absolutely true. So um, that's why the idea is that if you are getting the satisfaction out of your social relationships that is personal to you, whether that means that you, there are some of us who, I'm actually not this person, but there are some of us who like actually really love talking to the server at the diner or talking to a stranger at the park or on the bus and all of that looks like it's really good for you. But at the same time, if you have a tiny group of friends and maybe you're, you're actually sometimes even only connecting with them over the phone, um, that we see, we see benefits for both. It really is about, are you getting what you need out of your social relationships? And it doesn't have to look a particular way. I think this is one of the most important things that we discover when we really kind of break down different kinds of relationships that we have. And we see that it doesn't have to look a particular way. People are different and different things are gonna work for different people. And that means different relationships are gonna be most important. So yeah, we see we see strong benefits when people report that they feel supported. It doesn't matter what their network looks like necessarily. Does that answer the question? You don't want me to even get started there because that's one of my that if we're talking about social connectedness, all the different ways it can look are um, sexually. I'll never stop talking if I go there. But I will quickly, uh, because this is gonna come back to social connection again, talk about another source of managing the health effects of stress that maybe we don't necessarily think about relative to stress sometime, and that is diet. So I know that you have probably all heard about some of the brain healthy diets, the DASH diet, the Mediterranean diet, the one that combines them both called the MIND diet. These diets are filled with ingredients that directly improve physical and even brain health. But interestingly, 
one of the mind diets most touted benefits is that many of the foods are actually anti-inflammatory. So again, we're thinking not so much about stress itself, but some of the downstream consequences. Eating a better diet might help divert or reduce some of those downstream consequences that we're trying to avoid, that we're worried about. But actually, even more directly related to stress, what I always think about is how cooking intentionally, cooking with whole foods that take you a while to cook, it can have secondary benefits. For many people, cooking and eating together is a really wonderful source of connection with the people that we care about, or it's a source of relaxation, of unwinding from the day, of focusing on something else, which sounds a lot like one of the, the other uh, modes of coping that we're gonna talk about momentarily. If cooking is something that you enjoy, I think it should be embraced not only as a healthy choice, sort of, you know, just physically, but also as a tool that can redirect your mind and your spirit and, and help you manage stress. If it feels right, it's good for you. <clears throat> okay. I think this is the last thing that we'll talk about before we talk about mindfulness. Let me just check the time. This is a huge growing area of interest in dementia research, the positive impacts of nature, of being in, or even just looking at green spaces. And what we mean when we say green spaces is areas that are heavy in living vegetation. There is growing evidence out there in the, in the literature that more the more green spaces that people are experiencing or exposed to, the better their cognitive health is. Even some evidence that living close to a lot of, of green space is associated with fewer changes in brain structures over time. It helps you keep a, a bigger, healthier brain longer, regardless of kind of where you are on your aging spectrum. And there's enough evidence actually uh, for the mental health benefits of green space, that so there's even a really nice theory that devoted to the idea that nature and green spaces have psychological and restorative benefits for us. It's called the attentional restoration theory. And many researchers who study green spaces and brain health actually believe that stress reduction through restoration of being part of that green space is likely to be one of the primary pathways by which um, we explain the presence of green space with the presence of better uh, memory health as we age. Okay, so where to start? I just presented about four different potential interventions shown to buffer stress or to reduce the physiological consequences of stress experiences. Of course, we're gonna talk about one more here, mindfulness meditation before I stop. But I wanted to first get my take home message out there. I'm stopping at five, not because that's all there are, but because I know that it can feel kind of overwhelming at times to see recommendation after recommendation, especially if some of them don't feel like something that you yourself can manage right now, which is, the case for us. We have changing lives and sometimes there are just things that we can't do, recommendations that we can't follow. So my main message here that I want to leave you with before I turn, I, I'm going to review the scientific evidence for mindfulness meditation and then I'll turn it over to Ms. Sherry. But the first message that I really want to get to you before I, I leave off and stop talking finally you probably saw when we were talking about those other four uh, ways to manage stress, this kind of pattern, right? As we're going through these, these ostensibly separate um, stress management strategies. And that is that it's really hard to talk about one of them without talking about another. In real life, these strategies, whether it's green spaces or physical activity or social engagement, or, or healthy cooking and diet, these, they can't be easily separated. They all hold pieces of all of the others for people. Cooking meaningful foods is often connected to being people with people that we love, right? Um, spending time in nature is often connected to moving our bodies and getting our blood flowing. 
All of these activities, meanwhile, can also be done mindfully, focusing our mind and our spirit on the experience and the recovery that we're seeking from it, right? So studies to try to test interventions, we try to test them separately. We're always trying to parse the benefits of each component. But thankfully, I mean, unfortunately for me as a scientist, because it's always a real pain with intervention work, but thankfully overall, that's not how life works. You're getting the benefits of multiple mechanisms almost with any course of action that you take. So where should you start? Start with what you already love. Start with what feels good for you physically and mentally. Playing soccer, coaching soccer, hugging grandkids, whatever feeds your sense of well-being. Our lives carry us through a lot of different stages of being, depending on other things going on in our lives, right? And I think what all of this protective factive factor protection from dementia, keeping our cognitive abilities at the best that they can be no matter where we're at. What it suggests most importantly to me is just that we don't need to be doing it all, all the time. If we keep engaged in whatever mode is most enjoyable and works for us at a given time, keeps us physically and emotionally comfortable, we're doing right for our brain. Okay, so. Before Ms. Sherry leads us in this mindfulness meditation practice, I do just want to mention a little bit of the evidence behind mindfulness as a way to improve health and actually to slow down uh, any age-related cognitive change that we're going through. And we'll do it really quick. Whoops. Okay. So... Mindfulness meditation has been studied quite a bit, and that's because actually it's it has been organized well into this nice standardized eight-week program that lends itself really well to doing clinical trials, and which we, as you've probably heard because you've been around research long enough now, um, this is one of our gold standard research methods that we really rely on before we want to recommend things to people. So the program itself, this eight week program is actually framed specifically as a stress reduction program. And the trials have shown over the decades now have shown that mindfulness training and practice can be used to manage a lot of very stress adjacent diverse conditions like chronic pain, like depression, anxiety, and actually even substance abuse. There's a fair bit of research. As a public health researcher who thinks a lot about all of the complicated conditions that people are living in and trying their best to be healthy in, one of the most unique aspects of mindfulness sort of training to me is the emphasis on how useful it is to just practice when you need it and when you can, even if it's just for a few minutes. And I that is what I love about it. Because as a researcher, what we want to see is interventions working even outside of that, that clinical trial where all the rules are really strict and we're being really careful about the way things look. So it did take a while for mindfulness to catch on uh, as a potential intervention for older adults who were specifically looking for a way to age healthier, including maintaining cognitive abilities. Uh, for as long as possible. But there are now several studies that have laid down the basic foundational evidence that mindfulness practice does help to slow down cognitive decline that happens over time. So for instance, in a trial that focused on adults with memory complaints and in a trial that included both patients with MCI and their study partners, those people who participated in both cases in this eight week mindfulness program they performed better on their cognitive tests after the program ended than people who were similar to them in every way, except for that they hadn't engaged in the mindfulness practice that was part of the study. So that is the kind of like really strong foundational evidence that gives us a lot of hope, right? But there's actually more to it than that. So you don't need to focus too much on this graph here. I'll just quickly tell you about it. The thing I'm excited about when it comes to mindfulness is that there's evidence for long-term benefits of just informal practice that happens outside of the study. We talked about how that's the real, that's the real truth, right? For what it's going to mean for people out in the population outside of this university setting. 
So what we see here in this study, just to describe it, is that well, younger, this was a study of younger and older adults, some of whom engaged in a mindfulness training a long time back, seven years back, older adults that did the same thing, we're following them up now, seven years later. And what the study ultimately reported was that while younger adults tend to perform similarly on their cognitive tests, no matter how much time they spent practicing mindfulness, because they're not experiencing age-related change, right? So it's not so important for them. But among older adults, those who were practicing for an hour each day, sometimes a little bit less, it was actually associated with a pretty big reduction in age-related decline in executive function, which is a source of, of memory and thinking and planning that's really important. So what we know then is that, it, and it doesn't mean that they didn't experience any change. They did, almost everyone does, right? But these findings suggest that maybe because they were maintaining uh, an informal mindfulness practice, that change just happened slower than it otherwise might have, even seven years later. So who knows what the practice looked like? It's like a game of telephone, right? Um, it changes over time with what you need and what you can do. So participants most likely seven years later had pretty significantly changed uh, their practice to suit their needs and their abilities. And it remained effective, even taken out of the confines of that, of that research study. So this is the kind of thing that I think is most promising that this is an intervention that can meet the needs of people as we age and our capabilities and our limitations really change a lot over time. With that, I'm gonna stop talking. I am excited to answer questions later, but for now I wanna turn it over to, is it gonna be Ms. Sherry next? Is it gonna be Dr. Chin? I'm not sure. Yeah, thank you so much, Megan. I appreciate the presentation and um, the information. It always makes me feel like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing okay and I can always try something different to see how that helps me feel too. Um, yeah, so next we're going to move on to uh, my friend Sherry, um, who has uh, years of experience practicing mindfulness meditation. And um, uh, I'll do just a brief introduction and then Sherry, I'll let you carry on with a little more. But um, I met Sherry, oh goodness, I think it was four, three or four years ago um, through the program called New Friends um, that the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute and Alzheimer's Disease Research Center um, puts on. It's a program that pairs people who are experiencing um, memory or cognitive changes with uh, students at the UW. And uh, that's how I first met, met Sherry um, a while back. And we've done many other things together uh, throughout those years. Uh, so, uh, and one of the things Sherry does for some of the groups she's involved with is um, she'll lead some mindfulness exercises for some of those uh, groups that she's in. Um, so Sherry, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself a little further. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> oh, um, I love Sherry's purple hair, always. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, thank you, Bonnie. Um, and thank you, Dr. Megan. Um, that was that was really nice um, and helpful. Um, well, my, my name is Sherry Lull. Um, so real quick here, um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I, I was a therapist for, for over 30 years working with people with mental health and trauma and uh, substance use disorders. Um, and I also um, ran groups and, and taught mindfulness meditation. Um, but then about three and a half years ago, um, I was diagnosed with young onset dementia. Um, and so life very much changed. Um, I had to stop working, um, but uh, a lot of things that I used to do, um, I don't recall now, but the mindfulness has stuck with me. It has stayed with me. And... Um, other than support, I would say the mindfulness and the support 
of other people who have dementia, um, the social aspect that, that Megan was talking about, have been the two most helpful things for me in my experience so far. Um, it helps me to stay present. Um, like they say, um, the past is history and tomorrow's a mystery, you know, and today is a gift and that's why they call it the presence, right? Get it? The present? <laughs> okay. Um, so those of you, well, all of you know that with dementia comes a whole lot of um, fear and anxiety and confusion um, and, and it can be terrifying. So when the mind starts to go there, mindfulness saves me. It brings me back to right now. And um, what I thought might be helpful today um, with such a large group um, and Megan talking about the, the effects of stress on the body, um, I thought it might be helpful to do uh, what's called a six point body scan. And uh, when I've done this before, people fall asleep. Um, and that's not the purpose of, of this exercise. Um, the purpose is really to become more aware of your body and um, what you experience in your body without judging it as right or wrong or good or bad. It just is, you know. Um, and the thing that I found really helpful to stress and the environment and all that we experience mentally, mentally, physically, and spiritually. Um, we're making, with mindfulness, you're making new neural connections and new pathways. And you're retraining your brain and your body's responses to all that's going on within and without yourself. So, um, so if you like to be in a comfortable position, whatever that means for you, and um, if you feel safe and comfortable closing your eyes, that can be helpful for some. I will close my eyes. And at first, I'm just going to ask us to with your mind's eye to just focus on your breath and watch it with your mind's eye as it enters in through your nostrils, travels down the esophagus, and into your lungs, expanding your lungs on the in-breath and contracting slightly on the out-breath. So just watching the breath, through the entirety of the in-breath and the out-breath. I'm not trying to force your breath to be any particular way, but just noticing it and being with it as it is. Through the in-breath and the out-breath. And during this practice, if your mind begins to wander off, as the mind will do, that's just what it does, that's okay. Just when you notice that it has wandered away, just gently bring your awareness and your focus back to the breath. And maybe begin to notice the sensations with the breath. You might notice on the in-breath, the breath seems cool and dry. And as it travels through the lungs, on the out-breath, it seems warmer 
and more moist. There's nowhere else to be, nothing else to be doing or thinking about, but just being with your breath, moment by moment, breath by breath. You might move your awareness down into your body and just notice the sensations in your body. Perhaps noticing whatever it is you might be sitting on Notice the pressure of being held up. Just following the breath, the entirety of the in breath and the out breath. If the breath is difficult for you to, to follow, sometimes I will put a color to the breath. Whatever, whatever color seems calming to me in the moment. And I just watch this wonderful life-giving breath moving in and out of my body. So on the next in-breath, I'm going to ask that we send our breath all the way down from our head, all the way down through the body to your feet and your toes. So that we're breathing down all the way through the body and to our feet and toes and back up from our feet and toes and out again. So breathing down into the feet and just noticing any sensations that might be present in the feet. You might notice coolness or warmth, tingling, numbness, or the absence of sensation. Just noticing it and breathing down through the body to the feet and up through the body and out for two or three breaths. And on the next out breath, just releasing your feet from your mind's eye and bringing your awareness to the knees, the tops, the bottoms, the sides, and deep, deep within all of the intricacies of the knees. So that now we're breathing down through the body to our knees and up from our knees and out. Breathing down into the knees, 
just asking them to soften and relax with each breath to release on the out breath breathing down into the knees and back up and out for two or three breaths And on the next out breath, releasing the mind, the, the knees from your mind's eye and moving your awareness up to the region of the hips, the front, the back, the sides, and all that's within. And again, just sending your breath through your body down into the region of the hips. Back up from the region of the hips. Breathing down into the region of the hips. Just allowing it to, to relax and to soften and release. With each breath for two to three more breaths. And on the next out breath, just re releasing the region of the hips, moving our awareness up into the lower back and abdomen. This is an area that can cause some, some difficulties for some. So just noticing any sensations that might be present. I'm not judging them, but just noticing them and sending your breath down into the lower back and abdomen and up from the lower back and abdomen. Just breathing down to the lower back and abdomen, just allowing it to soften and to relax and release on an out breath for two to one. Three more breaths. And on the next out breath, just releasing from your mind's eye, the lower back and abdomen, and bringing your awareness up into the heart center. So your upper back and chest and all that's within. So let you breathe into the upper back and chest, to the heart center, and breathe out. Breathing in into the heart center. Again, just noticing any sensations that might be present. And just allowing this area to, to relax, to soften, and to release as best as it can on an out breath. For two to three more breaths.
And on the next out breath, just releasing the heart center from your mind's eye, moving your awareness up into the neck and the head. And just breathing in into the neck, into the entirety of the head, just filling it full of this wonderful life-giving force of the breath. Breathing in. And exhaling. Just allowing this area to relax and soften and release as best as it can. For two to three breaths. Now I'm going to ask that you just imagine that an area in the top of your head can just open up, just a small area that you can, it just opens up. And as you breathe, the, the breath comes in and moves up to this area, this small opening in the top of your head. And it comes back down through the entirety of your body, through your head, your heart center, your lower back and hips, your knees and your feet. So that you're breathing in from the top of your head all the way down through your body to the bottoms of your feet. And then breathing in from the bottom of your feet all the way up and out through the top of your head. Breathing in all the way from the top to the bottom of your feet. And up from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head. Just allowing this wonderful breath to move throughout your entire body and mind. bringing this wonderful, calming, life force energy to your entire being. And just noticing the sensations of this breath moving through the entirety of your body and up and out again. And perhaps taking a moment to thank yourself for giving yourself this gift of doing this practice in this moment. And continue to take it with you as you go throughout the rest of your day. So when you're ready, you can bring your awareness to the sounds around you and gently open your eyes. And I thank you for doing this with me. Thank you so much for leading us in that, Sherry. Um, I did almost fall asleep there for a little bit at first. Um, how does everybody feel? Um, you can put it in the chat or unmute and share how, how you're feeling after that. Yeah, well, it would be wonderful to, to hear from you as to what you noticed and what your experience was like. We got some and thumbs up. In the and there's chat, no someone said it was grounding, peaceful, relaxing. 
um, I feel that it's too cold in this room to really do that exercise. Okay. Mm -hmm. Too cold in the current room <laughs> to get comfortable. Yes. Yeah, I think um, like Sherry had talked about, like what does comfortable look like to you? And so that's that's good to know that that room probably isn't going to be as relaxing for you or provide you that space. And so uh, thanks again, Sherry, uh, for leading us through that wonderful experience and um, sharing a little bit about um, what it's like uh, for you to um, continue your life um, with dementia as the, the new sidekick on your adventure. So uh, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, mm -hmm. There is many different ways to practice mindfulness. Um, I went through one of those eight week courses Megan was talking about. I did a eight week mindfulness based mindfulness based eating awareness training at the UW back in like 2018. And it was all about food and mindfulness around what we eat, how we eat. Um, but just to talk a brief little bit more about um, mindfulness. Uh, I know most of you have probably heard us talk about the Dementia Matters podcast before. And um, Dr. Chin is the host of that. And we had an episode um, air with Dr. Uh, Vinny Miniacello. And um, it's about a 15, 20 minute podcast on mindfulness, what it is, what are the benefits, where to begin. And so it's a pretty quick, short listen that can um, give you some other ideas, things to try out. There's many apps out there these days. So he gives you some apps that he thinks are maybe a a little better to try out. Um, I'll go ahead and I can put that in the chat, but I'll also send it out in an email afterwards to everyone. So we're getting closer to our end time. Um, I thought we'd go ahead and see if there are any questions uh, for uh, Megan or Sherry or, or myself um, before we go ahead and wrap up. And you can feel free to just unmute and ask them or put them in the chat. I have a question for Megan. <laughs> um, so Megan, can you tell us what what is your favorite part of being a researcher? It's not necessarily related to the topic, but I'm curious. Uh, what 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 is what is your what is your favorite thing about uh, working in research? Um, it's uh, it's honestly times like this. So I have to tell you, you know, I um, I didn't get into when it, it's times like this when I can actually interact with people who uh, partners who are off doing completely different things and can offer their own perspectives. I got into um, cognitive aging and, and memory health research, not so much because I love, I had a background in neuroscience, but actually I got into it because I got a job right out of undergrad working in a memory health center at Northwestern University. And I realized that I really liked talking to the middle-aged and older people that came to our center. I wanted to work with them. I wanted to hear about what they were doing in their lives, both their challenges, but also um, the things that were making them happy. And that is really kind of uh, what turned into my research program because I saw so much value that people were attaching to the social conditions that they were living in. And I didn't feel like we were talking much about it, but I'll tell you, you go far enough in research and you don't get to talk to the people that got you into the research in the first place anymore. I, I sit in front of a computer now. So for me, it's coming into rooms like this where I can learn uh, from what's actually happening, what people actually care about um, that are my favorite part of my day, of my week, of my months these days. Otherwise, I'm just playing with the an Excel file. How fun does that sound? <laughs> uh, Megan, that does not sound fun to me at all. Um, no. <laughs> not a good way to, it's not a good way to learn what kind of research you should be doing either. Um, talking to people about what they care about is. So. 
thanks to everyone for being here and, and uh, keeping me entertained today. And um, say after the program, if you come up with a question that you would like um, Megan to answer, I will provide her contact information and the email that I uh, will send out because it'll be in the slides. Otherwise, you can always uh, send me an email and I can uh, get it over to Megan so she can answer that. Um, and then I just wanted to go over, we have a couple upcoming events that you might be interested in. Um, one of those events is our, we used to call it the fall community lecture, but we want to try to turn it into more of a conversation. So it's uh, going to be called um, the fall community conversation. And the focus on this is going to be new treatment options for Alzheimer's disease. So I'm sure just as I've been hearing, you've been hearing the things about different drugs that are um, being approved that can maybe uh, actually help with the disease progression or um, help with what's happening in the brain. And so we want to go ahead and make sure um, we're sharing what we know um, from a research standpoint, as well as pac practitioners, how they're thinking of potentially using um, those interventions. And so that is going to be Thursday, September 21st from 4.30 to 7.30 in Middleton, Wisconsin. Um, but we also are going to have a live stream for those of you that are not here in the area. Um, and I'm going to put the link in the chat and I'll also go ahead and that's going to be in the email as well. And then for 2023, we will have our last installment of Healthy Living with MCI, uh, Friday, December 8th. It's going to be personalized exercise to boost your brain health and memory. And so one of the things uh, you'll we'll hear about is maybe uh, some of those benefits, uh, kind of like Megan talked about, there might be some tie-in, right, between uh, what we heard. Um, and then, oh, uh, that's, uh, that's all I have for upcoming events. I'll put that in the chat. But we do have a question that just came in. Um, Megan, would you talk a little bit about medication that might help with chronic stress? Um, with the with the caveat that I'm not a clinician, um, so you know I I mainly focus on kind of non pharmacological um, predict, uh, predictors of of health. Um, but I would say you know if you're talking about we talked about in that diagram with all the different arrows, if you have if there's a medication that can address the down, a downstream effect of stress that you're living under that for a condition that in it is in and of itself um, a risk factor for more cognitive change over time than you would otherwise experience. I mean, I think that, you know, as long as your clinicians that you're working with don't think that the risks outweigh the benefits. We know that what you can take, say, for anxiety tends to change over time because different risks come into play if you're taking common anxiety medications when you're older. But, you know, the same is not necessarily true for uh, medications that treat depressive symptoms. I think that everyone, it's getting harder and harder uh, to seek mental health care right now. But I think that any kind of therapy, whether it's talk therapy or whether it's uh, a medication, if you have depressive symptoms that need to be addressed, then um, I think that, that that's absolutely crucial. The same is obviously true for medications that treat hypertension, or diabetes, even if these are downstream of stress, and even if stress actually makes it harder to manage those kind of conditions with medication, um, I think it's really, it, it certainly is worthwhile. That is a huge source of disruption and in intervention that we have, right, is intervening on these health conditions that result from stress. So I'm, I'm always going to advocate for people maximizing their well-being. Certainly there are other there lots of other therapies that we can talk about too and I think you know working out with your clinicians um what is going to be safe for you within that bound yes treat treat the symptoms of stress and the consequences of stress. 
take a multi-pronged approach, you know, prevent, but also treat when you need. Thank you for sharing that, Megan. Um, Dr. Chin, do you have anything to add to that? Is Nate back on the call? Good. Yeah. Uh, no, Megan gave a great answer. And one thing I would echo is that likely it's not one thing causing your symptom, and therefore it's not one thing that will treat your symptom. And so this idea of multimodal therapy, uh, it lives in the geriatric space, but it's present for everybody. And, and that really is taking advantage of these different non-medication-based interve interventions, many of which just make us feel good regardless. But then when, when the need is there to have these medication therapies, uh, ideally short-term, to, to help us. And so it is really a risk-benefit because you know nothing is without its side effects. Um, the side effect of meditation, of course, is feeling better and you've just spent some time doing it. So there's obviously not a down, downside to that. But with medications, yes, we always have to be thoughtful about um, what are the consequences of it, good and bad, and then how long should I be on it? I mean, the ultimate goal is to use it when it's needed and then get rid of it when it's no longer needed. Uh, and that's, of course, a conversation we have with our healthcare team, you know, with, you know, yourself, with your family to see how things are going. Um, but I, I'm, I completely echo uh, Megan's response and, um, and just the idea of being able to talk about it, I think, is the first and most important step. Thank you, Dr. Chin, for supplementing there. I'm not seeing any other questions come in, um, but I do see uh, someone put check out Healthy Ideas, I capital I V A E A S. Uh, it's a great evidence based program. Um, and then um, we're getting ready to sign off for the day. Um, when you sign off, you will, uh, before you can close out the window, a survey will pop up asking you to provide some feedback on today's program. Um, as working in research, we always want to be able to uh, have some results we can share about um, if you're being impacted by the programming we're providing. So please go ahead and, and take, it's 10 questions. I made it even simpler than before. So 10 questions, we'd really appreciate it. Um, mm -hmm. And then I will go ahead and send that follow-up email and we will see you in December. Uh, thanks again, um, Megan, Nate, and Sherry for joining us today and sharing your experience and expertise with us.